Hi there, welcome to today's NBS webinar, Building Services Engineering and Sustainability. Today's webinar is going to last uh, just under an hour. Uh, attendees' microphones are muted, but throughout the webinar, please provide feedback, ask questions uh, using the mechanism uh, on the webinar, and we follow up all questions uh, after the session. So today's speakers, uh, first of all, I'm Chair uh, Stephen Hamill, Innovation Director at NBS. Uh, but the first main speaker on today will be Carl Collins, who's Head of Digital Engineering at SIPSI. We'll then uh, hear from uh, both Louise Weil and Aidan Kelly, uh, sustainability experts at the Building Services Engineering Consultancy at XCO2. So without uh, further ado, pass straight over to Carl Collins, Head of Digital Engineering at SIPSI. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, I'd just like to talk a little bit about um, sustainability and the SIPSI approach to it. I'm going to start talking about the generalities and then get into some more specifics a little later on. The topics I'd like to talk about is what the aspects of sustainability are, what SIPSI guidance does in terms of sustainability, and some of the initiatives that we've been looking at in the past couple of years, and a little bit of a deeper delve into our TM65 process, which I'll explain a little bit more about later. So the aspects of sustainability are in the design, operation, the products, the materials, and the circular economy, so how much we can reuse stuff. In the design sphere um, we're looking here at how we approach building services and the um, approach we can take to limit the use of energy to limit the use of fossil fuels and to limit the use of products and materials the example we're showing here is you can take a space and you can cool it by using just power we can use a, for example a direct expansion cooling system but that has a lot of refrigerant in it which is quite damaging to the environment and uses a reasonable amount of power an alternative approach the designer could take would be to have a look at um, natural ventilation systems as you can see in the lower left now this is just through clever use of design and the, the physical properties of air warming in a building can be used to pull in cooler air so this is fairly design intensive but has an almost zero energy footprint which is obviously much more sustainable in terms of operation we can think about how we treat spaces so a, a very simple example is shown here we can turn down the thermostat a little bit and it's amazing how much energy can be saved just by turning down that thermostat and when we're saving energy, we're probably also reducing our reliance on fossil fuels to a degree. And as we know, fossil fuels are not only damaging to the environment, but getting rather expensive as well. We can have a look at the products that we use. Here are some very simple examples of building services products and how we specify those products. For example, we can take a, a light fitting, a luminaire, and that could be one that has actually been recycled and repurposed and reused. So all of the embodied carbon in the materials has already been taken into account in a previous project, and we can then take that fitting, uh, re-engineer it, repurpose it, and fit it into a new building, or even just refurbish it and put it back into the original building. The same is true for all of the products that we specify in building services. The materials is a slightly more complex area. There are many materials that we use in construction, um, in building services. The pallet that we use really is quite astonishing. Um, some materials I hadn't even heard of until fairly recently um, do go into the services products that we specify. And we need to think quite carefully about what those materials mean, because Every material at some point needs to be dug out as an ore, it needs to be refined into a usable material, and all of this uses energy, all of this can actually be re releasing uh, carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalent into the atmosphere. So we do need to think quite carefully about the materials that we use in the products that we specify. And one of the real new, well, fairly new um, aspects to look at is the circular economy. Now, to call it circular economy is a little bit of a misnomer because there's always an, a small additional input you need to keep products working and 
uh, to reuse and recycle um, each of them. But the less material we use, the less energy we use in uh, the products that go into our services systems, then the better that is for the environment. So how does SIPTI guidance start to deal with this? Well, we have literally hundreds of publications and they fall into a number of different categories. The highlight is really the guides. They're the, the big um, publications that give you the fundamental understanding of how to design and specify and construct building services systems. In addition to that, we have our technical memoranda, which are either things that are fairly new. Um, a good example is the TM65 and TM66, which I'll get into a little bit later, and things that are additional to the more generalized guidance that is in our main guides. We also have application manuals and various other things to help building services engineers understand what it is that they have to do. And one of the themes that runs through all of our publications is sustainability in terms that I just described earlier, all of those aspects of sustainability do exist in all of our publications. An example of this might be Guide A, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. So we look at things here like thermal design, plant sizing and energy conservation. So all of those design parameters that we talked about earlier are already here and front and center in the way we design building services systems. So as I said before, this is a topic that runs throughout all of SIBSI guidance. But let's look at a few of the initiatives that SIBSI have been undertaking in the last couple of years. I'm gonna talk very briefly about TM66 and digitization and then get into a little bit more detail about TM65. The TM66 is a method of specifying circular economy. This particular technical memorandum is about light fittings, luminaires, and how we can assess the recyclability of that product, how much we can reuse a, a given product in a manufacturer's range. And we've started to develop some tools to allow manufacturers to understand how circular their product is. I don't mean physically circular, I mean how much the materials and the sub-assemblies within that product can be used and used again with minimal input when they are taken from one building, repurposed, re-engineered and put back into another. So that's a thing to look out for. Um, if you are a manufacturer of luminaires, we will be extending this methodology to many other building services product types. So, uh, but that is a work in progress at the moment. There is um, a, 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 a law that um, light manufacturers have to take back the products that are removed from buildings at the end of life. So this is something that is very important to luminaire manufacturers. One of the other big quests we've been going on is the digitization of SIBSI knowledge. Now, this may not, on the face of it, relate directly to sustainability, but one of the things that it does do is it allows us to understand more deeply all of the aspects that go into the design and operation of a building. So we've created a number of different workflows that are uh, written out in our guides and technical memoranda, but there's a lot of data tables, there's a lot of formulae, there's a lot of workflows, and the more that we can digitise those, the more we can look at um, all of the aspects of sustainability through automation of our design processes, and I think Aidan is going to talk in a little bit more detail about an application of this a little later on. The one I want to get into a little bit more depth with is TM65. And this is about the embodied carbon in building services. And it is a method by which you can calculate the embodied carbon in a building services product. Now, one thing I should say straight away is there is a gold standard for understanding embodied carbon in products, and that's an environmental product declaration. 
if a manufacturer has an environmental product declaration, there is no need for them to apply the TM65 methodology. An EPD is and always will be considered as the best um, understanding there will be of not only the embodied carbon, but all of the other sustainability aspects like water eutrophication and things like that, that we really do need to understand within a building services product. However, it's often considered very difficult to do an EPD for the complex machines that we um, specify and design into our building services systems, which is why we came up with this TM65 methodology to help those who either can't afford or there's no specification to understand the embodied carbon in their products. The way that this works is really quite simple. There's a methodology in the technical memorandum and we have created at the moment a fairly simple tool in Excel for a manufacturer to understand what their product is looking like in terms of embodied carbon. This is increasingly becoming one of the specification points for building services products so it's really important to have an understanding of that we can't any longer just design on its performance its physical performance and on cost um, unfortunately too often building services systems are specified on the cheapest is the best and that really isn't the case anymore there are many many other aspects that we need to understand about a product before we can say it's suitable to um, put into a building services system once you have input the data that is required um, of this fairly simple tool you can get one of two results from it there is uh, a basic analysis and a mid-level analysis Again, I would emphasize that if you want a really, really good analysis of this, you would use an environmental product declaration. But as we can see on here, at the bottom of the screen with a little red oval around it, we've calculated the, uh, according to the basic method, the embodied carbon in this particular heat pump. This is only an example um, calculation. It's not based on a, a real product, but it does show that we can, with some fairly simple inputs, give ourselves a reasonable estimation of what the embodied carbon is for any given product. Now, individual products are one thing. A lot of building services are the things that join those products together. So, for example, a heat pump will be joined to emitters using pipework. It can be joined up using ductwork. We can run cable to and from various products using cable containment. And that's actually slightly more difficult to understand because it's not an individual product, it's a length of product. The ways we measure products in a simple world, we measure them by counting. So we can have a number of fan coil units or boilers, and we can say we've got four of those and we've got 10 of those. But we can also understand things by the length of things that there are or an area for example with paints or for a volume for example with concrete. In this example we're going to look at things that are measured by length which is pipework. Now a pipework system isn't just a pipe there's more to it than that. So in again in very simple terms it breaks down into there are supports, there's the pipe and there's the insulation. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the properties of those various components that go to form the overall system that we measure by length. And what we've created, again, is a very simple Excel tool. We uh, are hope, hoping to make this into a web service in the near future that understands through calculation the basic uh, embodied carbon per metre length of the pipework assembly. So we can see here we've got the material, the size, the insulation and the support. First of all, we can select the pipe material and here are some very simple um, metal pipe materials, copper, carbon steel and stainless steel. We look at the pipe size and the pipe sizes are taken from the standards that define how to manufacture these pipe work sizes. We look at the insulation, so we've got some fairly typical insulation materials and insulation thicknesses that will be specified for uh, an individual project or purpose. 
And we also look at the method of support. So the designer can use various different methods and uh, those methods may or may not be applicable to a particular pipe size. So we can use clips or hangers, or we can say there's uh, no particular support if it's being run on, for example, a tray system with multiple pipes. And we would then analyze the tray system separately. One of the ways that we can then use this information that we've gathered is, and this is just an example of use, I think Aidan is going to show a different application later on. We can make a schedule of all of the types of pipe and then group them together. So we've got, for example, copper pipe, it's 15 mil, it's insulated with mineral wool, the insulation thickness is 38 millimetres. And then we can calculate using that Excel calculator, the embodied carbon per meter run. And we can then input that in the field you can see on the right hand side. We can then add this property into all of the pipes and the pipe insulations. Um, and as long as we use the correct um, type of uh, parameter or property within our modeling software, this can allow us to do the calculations that we require. And what we have here is a separate schedule showing all of the pipe work within our project. It's got the same data as we had before, but here we've also got the length um, as a, a property there. We've inputted already, as we showed earlier, the embodied carbon per meter, and we can then perform a simple calculation of multiplying the length by the embodied carbon per meter. Again, here we show it very simply. You may notice that the formula says embodied carbon per meter times the length, which you may have noted was in millimeters. Some software will understand the units instinctively. So here multiplying one thing by a, a, one thing as a meter by one thing as millimeters, the software understands that these two things are different and adapts the calculation accordingly. If you're doing it in a, in a software platform that doesn't have this feature, then you may need to multiply or divide by a thousand. And then we can do the sum at the end of this, and we can see again with a little red oval around it, it's calculated all of the embodied carbon in all of those pipe work runs. And the cool thing about this is as we continue to develop our design, this is automatically summating all of that embodied carbon. So the more design we do, the better the figure we have. And we need to think carefully about the design workflow. So early stage design, say a concept, then there won't be much modelled. So we'll need to think a little bit more about the generality. But as we get more in towards uh, construction models, much more of the pipe work, hopefully all of it, will be modelled and we'll have a good idea of the embodied carbon for that pipe work system. We've done this for pipe work and we are working on similar systems for uh, ductwork systems and for cable containment systems. Um, we're fairly well advanced on the ductwork side and cable containment, we are working on that now and hopefully we'll have something ready for you um, in the very near future. I hope you found this uh, a little bit uh, of interest and um, it shows the ways in which we can start to understand the embodied carbon aspect of sustainability. As I mentioned earlier, there are many other aspects of sustainability that we need to consider. And we really hope that we'll be de developing new tools in the future to help us understand those further aspects, um, to help you specify the products that are required um, for your building services systems. Um, that's the end of my presentation, and I would like to hand back to Stephen, um, who I think has a couple of questions for me. Stephen. Thank you very much, Carl. So our next presentation is part of today's webinar. Uh, is from Louise Weil, Associate Sustainability Consultant at XCO2, and also Aidan Kelly, Senior Mechanical Engineer at XCO2. So Building Services, Engineering and Sustainability, over to you, Louise and Ian. So thank you very much, Stephen and Carl. That was a really interesting presentation. Uh, we are going to talk about what we do here at XCO2 to achieve sustainable outcomes in building services engineering. So presenting today, you have myself. I'm Aidan Kelly. I'm a senior mechanical engineer here at XCO2. And me, Louise Willett. I'm an associate sustainability consultant at XCO2. 
Um, just a little bit about XCO2. Um, I'm assuming most of you will know what we do, but we are a building services and environmental design um, consultancy um, running on our 15th year. Um, we did actually win the building uh, performance awards at 60 for small consultancies this year, which we're very proud of. Um, and um, we have uh, offices in London and in Singapore as well. Um, the main premise for uh, XO2 has always been to reduce the environmental impact of development um, through an integrated building performance approach uh, and really cutting carbon at, at the core of everything that we do. So uh, for a quick introduction, sustainable outcomes are clearly what we would all like from, from all our projects, but um, we kind of wanted to crystallise what exactly they are. And luckily for us, Reba really handily uh, set out to define these sustainable outcomes in their 2019 guide. And that's where they outlined uh, nine key sustainable outcomes aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. So uh, what we were going to look at today is looking at where we as building services and sustainability consultants can contribute to each of those uh, sustainable outcomes. And then we're going to look at these outcomes and then see uh, what design considerations uh, are key and also look at some case studies. Yes, um, and we will be returning to these so um, a, a few times throughout the presentation. These are the REBA 2030 Climate Challenge um, target metrics um, for domestic and non-domestic buildings. Um, now there are a number of, um, of targets um, similar to these that have been set by uh, the London Energy Transformation Institute, LETI, um, UK GBC, and um, the GLA and others, um, but for today we're using these just as a sort of a bit of a red thread um, throughout the presentation. So the first sustainable outcome that we want to look at is good health and well-being. Now this is the broadest umbrella under which uh, most of our work sits, as so much of our day-to-day -day work is ensuring that we deliver safe, comfortable and enjoyable indoor environments. So that work would include thermal comfort, lighting, ventilation, public health, fire safety, uh, all the way to security, to name a few. Um, but of course, as we've only got 25 minutes today, we want to focus just on two interlinked contributions where we have a kind of nice design consideration and case study. And these are overheating and daylighting. And these clearly are hot topics ever since the UK got a taste of uh, European style heat waves that may soon become ever more prevalent. So what we've done internally is we've kind of developed a a internal parametric tool to help us deliver environmental guidance at the, the outset of projects and also to help visualize the complicated balance that we have uh, between daylight, thermal comfort and energy. So uh, we've created a tool where we've got the following variable parameters. We have orientation, um, where we've got the four cardinal directions, number of glazed panels, uh, shading type. So again, that's looking at horizontal, vertical or a mixture of the two, the two. The number of these horizontal and vertical shades, the actual, the angle of them as well, glazing specifications, so looking at the G value, as well as also the ratio of ventilation panel openings. So looking kind of underneath the bonnet, this is the parametric uh, cooling energy use tool that we've uh, developed using the visual scripting um, tool called Grasshopper in Rhino. And this is a parametric tool which simulates the cooling energy use as well as the, the daylight performance uh, for either a small subset of a building, could be an apartment, could be an office block, and we use these variable inputs to calculate um, results that we can then look at in uh, a tool called Design Explorer. And in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see the parametric tool in action. So when we uh, conduct thousands of iterations for this uh, project, we actually went to a total of over 13,000 simulations. We can then explore the design possibilities uh, in Design Explorer, which gives us a, a method to interact with the data to formulate kind of an optimal solution. So playing with the sliders you can see here on the left, where you can uh, adjust the variable parameters uh, that will then instantly show you um, the corresponding outputs, uh, as well as also the visualizations you saw on the previous slide. And this interactive approach is uh, really valuable when, when we're prototyping and testing kind of different weather locations as well and providing environmental feedback on design modifications. Um, but for some complex analyses or, you know, for some who find Design Explorer not the easiest tool to use and understand, uh, we've also developed a, a hyper simple front end tool which can be used uh, by architects, um, MEP and quantity surveyors as well to kind of instantly change some of those variables and then uh, understand the daylight factor and the cooling energy use. 
So onto the next sustainable outcome that we want to look at, and that is the sustainable water cycle. So again, we can help this as uh, building services consultants by aiming to minimize usage, again, designing within ambitious targets, and then looking at um, the on-site water cycle with things like gray water recycling, rainwater harvesting, and more. So again, those targets that we mentioned earlier um, have set out some key metrics for domestic and non-domestic buildings. So we take those into account, and when we're at the kind of design stage, um, it's, you know, it's up to us to make sure that we are challenging clients to be as ambitious as possible. So where we see targets that are below the 2030, we see if we can push these all the way to um, that 75 litres per person per day and, my, and less than 10 litres per person per day for non-domestic buildings. Um, when we kind of work on larger master plan style work where we can actually set uh, the strategy for water management on site, um, you know, we can really uh, be ambitious and aim for a sustainable water cycle to keep the maximum amount of water on site focusing on sustainable sources, efficient use, on-site processing, and non-potable uses and storage. So you can kind of see um, this case study that we're just, uh, you have here on screen. Uh, this is for a, a kind of a recent master plan on a project in Vietnam, where we've got a, I'll just get my laser pointer, we've got a saltwater well serving a desalination reverse osmosis plant that will then provide potable water to, to the buildings. And from these buildings, we can have a gray water treatment plant with some filtration via reed beds to then serve a treated gray water pond where we can even have some, uh, have some fish and some uh, uh, water life there. We've got rainwater collection as well that can then serve a micro hydro plant into some mechanical rainwater storage tanks to then feed some amenity spaces, so rainwater lagoons and brackish water lagoons that could be used for swimming. And we can also use kind of the, the effect of this runoff to uh, create some evaporative cooling to improve thermal comfort um, for those on the beach as well. So it's, it's really, like, you know, looking at the whole water cycle holistically to achieve a, a good sustainable outcome. Right. Now on to the next um, topic that we wanted to discuss today, um, probably the most um, talked about um, in sort of wider media um, and just, just general discourse, net zero carbon, um, of course, um, probably also the, the biggest topic, um, you know, generally that we work on, um, kind of our bread and butter work uh, at XCO2. Uh, now in the background there, you can see Chris Skidmore MP signing legislation to commit the UK to a legally binding target of net zero by, by 2050. And now, um, what does that mean, um, I guess, is then the question that's been asked uh, and, and attempted to be answered um, by a number of, uh, of um, industry bodies um, since we go to the next slide. Um, there, I mean, so these are the uh, UK GPC um, framework definitions um, for, for uh, net zero um, buildings. So um, product and construction stage um, emissions being zero negative, that's embodied carbon, uh, and then operational energy on an annual basis being zero negative, that's operational. Uh, and I guess, you know, um, the, the, there's there's a number of industry bodies, as I said, uh, Reva, as we've, as, as we've seen, um, one of them setting targets for then what level can we actually um, achieve, um, uh, you know, in a top down and a bottom up approach. So what can we realistically achieve on buildings for operational uh, and uh, embodied carbon which we push really really hard and uh, that's the that's sort of the um the bottom up approach and then top down what uh, can the grid supply um in, in terms of embodied um so in terms of renewable energy really supply to all of us that we all have to share um which will be the top down approach and then you know hopefully we can match those two to some some realistic targets um, on the slide, there's just some of the um, some of the media attention this is all getting. We know it's really we we know it's a really big topic. Um, we've got sort of uh, David Attenberg um, putting um, focus on it. We've got um, top politicians, um, etc. Um, so just to talk about operational carbon, first of all, I won't talk about this in a great amount of detail, um, mostly because I think we are all um, familiar um, with. I guess operational carbon more so than than most other of the well more so than embodied carbon um, topics. But of course, this is the key area we where we in in um, building services can influence emissions, uh, and is a key part of of net zero. Um, again, Reba Climate Challenge um, target metrics are are set up there. There are others out there to say. 
Um, now, um, a key point, again, I, I think this has been talked about many times, but of course, uh, electricity grid decarbonisation just, has just meant that we're seeing a lot of changes in the actual systems that we're implementing in this current Pat L um, uh, SAT 10.2 factor of uh, 0.136 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour in the electricity grid, which is um, so much lower than, than the previous number that it's just pushing us all towards more and more electric systems because they're more carbon efficient. So more electric systems, um, CHP is more or less out, heat pumps uh, are you know, the new black, um, and I'm sure everyone is experiencing this on, on all of their, their projects. Um, the switch to uh, electric buildings might trigger other things like requirements for substations, um, and, and we, we should all be looking at sort of um, demand response, um, peak locking and things like that as well to, to help balance that out and help the grid to cope. There are um, concerns with increasing utility costs, fuel poverty that we're trying to, to deal with as well uh, and make sure we have um, you know, suitable outcomes there. And then there are other indirect benefits as well, like uh, local air quality from, from the emission of um, you know, on-site combustion. Um, again, not going to dwell on this alone, but I guess uh, I think we all uh, are aware Part L uh, of building regulations just covers uh, um, regulated operational carbon emissions, so not not even the whole operational carbon emissions, and all of the embodied carbon emissions are not covered by PATL at all. Uh, and that's uh, and then there's the there's the performance gap as well. I guess uh, partly because we're not covering all of those unregulated energy, but also because PATL was always a methodology um, rather than a real uh, energy. I guess um, estimate a tool. You know, it's not. It was never meant to be a tool to estimate how much energy a building will actually use. Now we have other tools now like TM54, um, which is CIPSI uh, and designed for performance, which <clears throat> uses various um, sort of levels of modeling to estimate this much more precisely and try and close uh, the performance gap. And indeed, um, CIPSI TM54 has been worked into the latest um, Part L for, for certain types of buildings and certain sizes of buildings now uh, as well. And I guess understanding all of that um, energy consumption that's sitting there that we're not seeing in Part L is key for actually reducing actual carbon emissions in buildings. And one of the ways we can reduce um, operational carbon as well on site is kind of a, yeah, looking at the, the future of heating and integrating, integrating low carbon heat sources in, into, our, um, into our projects. And so one of the case studies that we're going to talk about today is the, uh, the heat work analysis work we did for the Broadwater Farm Estate in North London. So this uh, is a site that has a, an existing district heat network uh, currently served by a um, six megawatt gas boiler system. Uh, and as part of the estate regeneration, there will be the construction of three new blocks, uh, sets of townhouses. And these uh, new blocks uh, will connect to a, um, a new energy centre. Uh, but however, to meet the um, ambitious energy targets for the site, 20 to 25 percent of the energy use uh, is required to come from a low carbon source to offset all of the residual emissions for the new build element to help drive the new build element to, to net zero. Um, so in order to do this heat work analysis, uh, we had to create a heat network energy model as per the, the CIPC uh, heat networks code of practice. And this would allow us to assess the, the impact of uh, the heat pumps in, in uh, conjunction with thermal storage and the, uh, and the boilers to see if we can uh, meet that 20 to 25% uh, target. Um, again, you know, we, we need to assess the annual load in 30 minute intervals and we need to use variables such as SIBC weather data and heat pump efficiencies because they, these heat pump efficiencies are of course uh, variable based on that, um, that SIBC weather data, which is also gonna drive the uh, estimates for the heat loads across the site. So using our model, we were able to do this assessment and show that a uh, installation of a 360 kilowatt air source heat pump uh, plus water source heat pump boost unit, which uh, achieves the uh, on-site network temperatures of 80 degrees C, could meet just over 40% of the um, total annual energy use for the site. So again, um, you know, showing the amazing efficiency of using um, a hybrid system of heat pumps and boilers to deliver um, great carbon savings again, because these heat pumps are able to meet the much lower base loads um, for the uh, heat network uh, throughout the year with the boilers meeting the less frequent peaks. Right, on to um, the embodied carbon as the next topic. Um, it is a bit of a whistle stop tour, this we do, we do acknowledge. If you go to the next 
slide uh, there, I guess. Um, again, there are um, rebirth uh, challenge targets for this, so it is one of the key topics, again, that we're all dealing with a lot in the industry. Um, yeah, and of course, if, if the in body carbon, all of the all of the emissions that are related to uh, all of the products and materials um, uh, that we bring onto site, and all the maintenance and repairs of the products, and any new products we bring onto site um, during uh, operation, um, and then the end of life disposal. Now, um, this slide is just, and, I, and I'm sure again, um, this isn't um, this isn't um, potentially news, but. Um, you know, ultra low energy um, buildings on the right hand side there. Um, what we're trying to illustrate is that the total pie of carbon emissions or carbon associated with that building, of course, total pie becomes smaller on ultra low uh, energy buildings. But the proportion of that um, carbon that's associated with that building that is embodied carbon is much, much greater. So hence why, as we are, have been reducing uh, operational carbon over the past years and years and getting better and better at that, um, embodied carbon just becomes more important as a bigger piece of the pie. Um, I just put this in here. I'm sure many people are familiar with this. Um, just because we're going to be referring to that um, throughout um, these next um, this next part of the presentation. But effectively, um, B6 operational energy use uh, is the is the main one that we've been dealing with for the past sort of ten years. Um, most of us, um, and that, and even just a small chunk of that, as I showed earlier. The rest, um, all of the A's and uh, and the B's up to sort of B5 is all uh, embodied carbon to do with uh, manufacturing um, products, um, raw supply and maintenance and repairs. And then you've got the C's, all of the end of life stage. Um, uh, the, 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 the D um, block there is more sort of what then happens when the, when the materials might then get reused in the next, in the next project down the line. Um, uh, Carl talked a bit about the uh, environmental product declaration, so that's one of the great tools that, uh, that we have to reducing embodied carbon emissions. I guess uh, I won't talk a lot about it here, uh, and a lot of these um, items are, are, um, are sort of more collaborative within the design team uh, and not so much up to us at MEP. We do have a couple of design um, uh, examples. Uh, though from that, but building less, reducing materials in general, and building light, and making things uh, that are sort of adaptable, that don't need um, great strip out to be reused for other um, purposes, things that have longevity, uh, and then things that have low carbon in the materials, of course, um, in general. And then thinking about the end of use, how we can dismantle rather than tear things apart, so um, avoiding adhesive and building in layers. And so with tools like Carl's uh, TM65 tool, I think uh, specification of building services products is going to become more and more important. So we need to think about um, some innovative uh, product selections. And you know, just one example could be uh, a, uh, this one you can see on screen, which is cardboard ductwork. And this may be um, useful for temporary installations or where we kind of see the effect of uh, distribution, uh, such as ductwork, on the embodied carbon figures. We also need to think about design for off-site manufacturing optimization as well. So again, as building service engineers, we can reduce waste during construction by designing for repeatability, which will help us <coughs> to use off-site manufacturing optimization using standard components such as utility cupboards, cor corridor modules, wall modules, sectional risers, and even toilet modules. Um, and also kind of talking about putting CARS tool into action, um, Internally, we've kind of been looking at an embodied carbon workflow to use this TM65 embodied carbon pipework tool to kind of give us an estimate of embodied carbon distribution. So by modeling uh, a single instance of a typical flat within a, a standalone rivet model, we then export the material takeoffs to, uh, to Excel. And uh, once we've tabulated these carbon factors to pipework lengths, again, you know, assign the different carbon factors for different pipework uh, diameters and insulation types, we're then going to be able to uh, get an estimate for that carbon distribution per flat. And we can also do the same for that work and, and hopefully soon um, containment. Right, on to then whole life carbon. So I guess this is just sort of um, um, combining the operational and body carbon that we've just been talking about. Um, so yeah, if you go to the next slide, uh, as we said at the beginning, I guess, yes, whole life carbon is operational carbon plus embodied carbon. Um, coming back again to um, and what Carl also talked about, sort of um, a circular economy approach of reusing and keeping materials in in circulation and and, and replacement and minimizing uh, maintenance and all of that as well. 
Uh, so uh, the typical kind of um, graph for a building, uh, a whole lot of carbon throughout the building life cycle, a big chunk of embodied carbon um, at construction stage, bits of uh, replacement and maintenance coming uh, throughout the years, um, maybe some bigger refurbishments once or twice, um, smaller repairs and maintenance, uh, and a chunk at the end when you're um, de deconstructing the building. But then, of course, the operational um, carbon emissions um, just ongoing every year on year, and I guess they could they could reduce as as um, grid um, uh, carbon emissions go down as well. Um, we have a case study here. We did a project called Wood Street Library up in Walton Forest, um, six to seven new homes, family and homes hub, um, and we did energy and body carbon and all of carbon analysis. So uh, just to go through, so we did uh, operational um, analysis. We were able to use uh, letter design guide U values, a very good air tightness, um, mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, a sort of a, a PV array um, to reduce um, carbon emissions by almost 60% overall. And that's uh, that's um, based on Pat L um, SAP couch um, 20, 2012 um, with the carbon factors that were in, in London at the time, SAP 10 carbon factors. Uh, now, the embodied carbon, we also looked at reducing. You'll see there um, the substructure and the superstructure make up by far the biggest embodied carbon uh, emissions of this building. That's often the case. Concrete is very embodied carbon heavy. Um, and we implemented cement replacement, which gave us 34 um, and a half kilograms CO2 per square meter saving in embodied carbon. And other things we looked at were generally much smaller carbon savings, um, like calcium sulfate, 0.8 kilograms CO2 per square meter. But I mean, I guess every little helps when you're trying to nudge those numbers down. And then looking at then the whole life carbon, as you can see on the left there, the base case, um, all of the embodied carbon chunks kind of were the different substructure, superstructure, um, et cetera. Uh, and then you have the at the bottom there, that's the, all of the operational, um, as well, there's embodied carbon and then the operational energy, of course, adding a, a, a great amount there. Um, and then on the right hand side, you can see what those reductions meant. Um, embodied carbon may be a little harder to see there because the operational, of course, gets added up over a number of years and therefore is a much larger chunk there. So our next sustainable outcome is a sustainable life cycle cost. And so one of the main ways that we can help to achieve sustainable life cycle costs is uh, through obviously carrying out life cycle cost analysis. And one of the areas that we as building services engineers and sustainability consultants can look at is uh, the energy strategy. And so at Exio 2 we've developed a, an in-house tool to simulate um, combinations of various renewables and low carbon technologies so that we can um, analyze and assess the best scenario based on carbon emissions, capital expenditure, operational expenditure and the return on investment or the, the payback time. So what we've done, and we're kind of uh, looking at this on more of our kind of um, uh, off-grid resort style projects is setting a base case. So here you can see the business as usual, 15% PV and, and no storage. And we can see the cooling, domestic hot water and waste heat utilization figures, electricity usage as well, water balance, and all of those um, variables that I mentioned earlier in the top left-hand corner. Um, we can then look into um, see what improvements we can make. So again, if we increase the PV um, uh, provision and introduce battery storage, we can see the increase in capital expenditure. Uh, however, we can see the, the OPEX and the payback start to improve. And then if we also look at um, innovative technologies, such as, uh, again, keeping that PV at 30%, but then looking at ice storage as well to help kind of drive down um, electricity uses on cooling, we can then present these options to the client and see you know, what is within the realms of possibility of capital expenditure, what is uh, acceptable as a payback period as well, and also if we're achieving their operational carbon targets to then choose uh, a suitable uh, sustainable life cycle option. Moving on, sustainable transport is our next sustainable outcome. And where you know we can contribute to that uh, is through the design of infrastructure for electric vehicles. Again, gonna become ever more important. So handily, um, there's new approved document S, which is the um, uh, design uh, stand from uh, the government on infrastructure for charging of electric vehicles. And we also have the SIBSI TM67 guide for electri electrification of buildings for net zero, which handily has some further guidance and worked examples just showing the impact of um, what will happen to uh, yep, building demand as we add those um, 3.7 kilowatt and 7.4 kilowatt charges. We can also begin to consider 
integrating vehicle to grid technology. So again, by introducing these bi-directional vehicle to grid charges, we can allow you know, users to sell surface energy stored in their EVs and effectively uh, turn their electric cars into demand response. So if we can introduce more of these demand response nodes kind of throughout, um, throughout the country, then it will really, really help um, uh, kind of lessen those demands on the grid during peak times. So our penultimate outcome uh, is then sustainable land use and ecology. Again, you know, not typical building services scope, but again, it's still something that we can contribute with, again, through looking at zero on-site emissions, uh, PVs and green roofs. So in terms of zero on-site emissions, we can design uh, fantastic buildings uh, all using low carbon technology. However, we've still got to think about life safety systems and life safety systems such as sprinklers and uh, uh, smoke ventilation systems will always need, um, well, will often need a secondary power supply. And more often this is uh, specified by a diesel generator, which is gonna be that final um, on-site fossil fuel burning appliance. However, if we can and, and get them there nice and quickly, we can remove the emissions associated with diesel generators, which do need to be tested quite regularly um, and introduce uninterruptible power supplies instead, which effectively a, um, yeah, should be a, a sealed room uh, full, of, full of batteries. So again, if we can get into the design early, we can again achieve that on zero on-site emissions target. Yes, and then just talking a little bit about PVs and green roofs, I guess one of those classic symbiotic relationships um, in building construction where we need to work with a number of different designers. Um, so the structural engineers will have an input on the weight of the roof, um, the landscape uh, and architect, uh, landscape team and architects will have an input on this. But you know the 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 bio solar roofs work really well. The um the the planting keeps the PVs a little bit cooler. The PVs uh, give them nice shading, and there's even uh, known to be sort of various critters like spiders and other things that quite like to live in those brackets. So one of those things that works really well and that we um that we implement where we can and and indeed in in the London um in the London plan especially you know that it is a requirement everywhere where there is a bit of roof kind of available that we do something like this. Now, um, all, on to the last topic, so um, sustainable communities and social value. I'm not going to talk about this a lot, but um, it's a slightly sort of um, wider topic that we do get involved with where we can to create sustainable communities and add social value by designing communal integrated energy systems. Um, yeah, so I guess when we are integrating um, building services into city planning, we can widen our scope to provide holistic guidance and that will be based on uh, the locality, so um, that would be things like solar angle, uh, the latitude, aquifer, the depth, for example, distance from water off the site, um, the local weather, uh, local available resources, um, local carbon factors even. Um, and then we may also write in our scope to consider social value, so um, that can be things like implementing social hubs, um, apprenticeships during construction, upskilling of, of, of workforce um, and we could we, we sometimes get involved with writing um, sustainability charters to sort of encompass um, all of this. Now um, in summary I guess um, yeah I know this was a bit of a whistle stop tour of uh, all of the sort of oh, some of the sustainable outcomes I guess that we are working towards it's a very broad topic um, there's more, um, uh, but I think we're, that's more than enough for today. So I guess from our from our side, um, thank you for your time, and um, I think we're going to go on to some questions. Thank you very much, Aidan. Thank you very much, Louise. So uh, down to myself, just to, to wrap up, I just want to uh, point out a few links which we'll send through by email afterwards. But if you go to our sustainability uh, page on MBS, and just scroll down. There's an article, detailed article here, which talks about how MBS can help you specify more sustain sustainably. And that, that article is structured around the RIDA sustainable outcomes. So it's quite a nice complimentary read following the X CO2 presentation today. Uh, there's also details on how to download the sustainable futures report from MBS. And I just uh, I jump across. Uh, here you can download uh, that at this this link, which we'll send through uh, as well. Uh, and there's also a little bit about what MBS 
as part of the wider Big Factor Group is doing in terms of sustainability as an organization. So uh, you can have a little read about that and see our sort of annual sustainability statement as a company there uh, as, as well. Uh, another link we sent through is the NBS guides uh, to sustainable specification, of which the first part is now live as a sort of free PDF uh, that can be downloaded, put together by our NBS technical team covering different disciplines. And the final link that we'll send through is for those that might want to have a little bit more information about the NBS specification product, NBS Chorus. And this is a specification platform that's used uh, by over 3,000 uh, practices across the UK. And that covers architecture, structural engineering, building services engineering, landscape architecture. And uh, if anyone would like a demonstration of NBS Chorus, please just drop a, a note uh, in the questions and learn about how you can uh, sort of improve your specification writing, make it more efficient, how you can collaborate with different consultants uh, online, integrate specification with uh, the 3D uh, design model, and uh, will work anywhere on uh, any platform. Uh, a reminder that uh, Sipsi and MBS uh, are in the second year of a, a partnership now. Sipsi are a proud to endorse MBS as uh, their official specification and product data partner. And we have discounts for Sipsi members, which you can find out more about again by just popping a a message in the, the, the Q&A box now or visiting the website, the mbs.com forward slash SIPC, which is uh, highlighted at the bottom of the page there. Search MBS SIPC on, uh, on, on Google. So yeah, please pop a message in the chat if you'd like to know more. Uh, visit the mbs.com to find out more about the specification product and also lots of uh, knowledge articles and downloads, PDFs that you can get for free. Uh, drop us an email, info at the mbs.com, and uh, visit our little sub website, the mbs.com forward slash Sipsi. Thank you everyone for the time today. Uh, bye bye.